So I, yesterday, I, I got home and I was uh, informed that I actually went the whole evening uh, without mentioning the website, the excavation website. So uh, leave it to a man with a PhD that he can't do the simplest task here. So I, this is sort of a prequel to the lecture tonight. I decided to put up here because I know that some who are either watching this or here this evening might want to follow the results of the excavation this summer. Uh, during the course of the excavation, I usually do a daily blog with a selection of pictures and describing what we're doing. And it will uh, be posted on, on the DIG website. Uh, it's very simple, elaragexcavations.com. Uh, it's a fairly rich site. It has a lot of videos from, that relate to our excavation, either my speaking or other things that have been done on it. Uh, articles are there, uh, news, media, everything. So it, everything that goes around about El Araj excavations is on this site. Um, and if you, if you remember it, bookmark it, whatever, you can come back there and visit to during the course of the excavation. And you can see the report that's coming out uh, from the land itself. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, I forgot to mention it yesterday evening in the midst of all the questions about it. Am I discussing it? I, I should have pointed out uh, that we have a website uh, where all of our uh, results and the things that we're doing are on there. So uh, please feel free to visit that. And uh, I want to just post it there. But our subject this evening uh, is something else. Um, we want to talk about Jesus which is one of my favorite subjects, uh, both from a faith standpoint as well as my um, research. Uh, as uh, Dr. Leniak mentioned, I, I actually, and I'm going to weave this together a little bit this evening. This is a bit autobiographical because um, to understand what I'm doing with this material and how I'm approaching it, uh, it's part of, of who I am. And I am especially interested in students, what motivates students to give themselves over to study, and how you go about it. Um, I, I, in my graduate work, I went to ORU, or Roberts University, and my graduate work, I did a, a course in Septuagint. Uh, and we were looking at how they translate the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew scriptures, into Greek. And of course, whenever you translate, you always interpret, always. I always remind my students of that, that when the Bibles they hold that are in English, Spanish, German, whatever, every translation is interpretation. There's a process of interpreting. It goes on. So we were doing it, looking at the Hebrew, reading into the Greek, and looking at the process of interpretation, the ideas that they were expressing, and how they were translating the Hebrew. Fair enough. We had a a professor, I had a professor that at the last 10 minutes of class, you know, we look at, uh, if any of you study Greek, you were looking at syntax, grammar, idioms. We got to the last 10 minutes of class, and he would say, okay, now, open your New Testament. And he would show us the same things that we had just been looking at in the Septuagint, and he would ask the question, what is the Hebrew behind this Greek phrase? And I was sort of, it, it was, it sort of jolted me. And it, it sort of started me thinking that there were, there were currents under the New Testament text. It's Greek and it's language, but oftentimes it's meanings, it's idioms, were Hebrew, Semitic. And that started me on a process of sort of thinking about where I wanted to go, the trajectory that I wanted to take. Um, I eventually ended up in, in Jerusalem studying at Hebrew University with uh, David Klusser, who was, at that time, uh, he's no longer living, but it was, during his day, he was considered Israel's foremost authority on pre-70 Jewish thought, and particularly as it pertains to Christian origins, Jesus and the beginnings of Christianity. So I went and studied with Flusser, and I was there. Uh, I had the privilege to study with him, do my doctorate. Uh, we came back. You know, some of you were here yesterday evening. You heard we lived there 16 years. It was actually two, two, year, um, two eight-year stints. And I came back and spent another eight years in working alongside him. Uh, we worked together in the work that was called Jesus 
It's now being, uh, has been republished in Erdman's called The Sage from Galilee. Uh, it's looking, it's a, it's a historical biography of, of the life of Jesus and have the opportunity to work that closely with him and sort of turn over every stone. Um, so my training, as I was saying last night, is as an historian and how to read history through the eyes of language, looking at language, the contours of language, and what it says to us about, uh, about events that took place. Um, but as Dr. Lanik mentioned, um, being a starving student with a wife and children to support, uh, during your doctorate, you have to work, you have to do things. And I was approached by Christ Church, the Anglican Church in the Old City, and they uh, asked me if I would be willing to uh, help them. They had a uh, accommodation uh, there, a guest house, and they wanted to accommodate in a more formal way visitors to the land and biblical study tours. Now today, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of biblical study tours, but in, in the mid-80s, there, there weren't so many. Uh, and so they wanted to set up a biblical study tour. And they asked me if I would help them. I had some business background and asked me if I would be willing to help them create the program which became Shorish, um, the Shorish study tours. Um, and I mentioned that because, and you're going to hear me come back to this theme again and again this evening, is that one of the things that it, it did to me is it pushed me out of my comfort zone because I was used to being in the library and reading a text, a very safe environment. But suddenly I was helping to lead these trips through the country, working with Israeli guides, and I was on site. And of course, someone else is doing the guiding. I would do sometimes instruction, but I had some free time to sort of open the scripture on site and to look at the dynamics, the interplay between land and text. And sometimes it, I would... I would read the story and it wouldn't quite fit. Or let's just say the way I had read the story didn't quite fit where I was, the contours of land. And that was the, really the beginning of the opening of my eyes of the importance of approaching this material in an interdisciplinary fashion, using multiple disciplines. Um, and I've encouraged over the years my students uh, to be careful not to be comfortable just in the text and reading the language. And I've tended to find that people get in their zone. Historians like to stay in the library and the archaeologists are out in the land. And it's, it, it, sometimes they need to bump into each other a little bit more and, and to be uncomfortable in their assumptions and challenged in their assumptions. So this evening, I want, in the limited amount of time that we have, uh, we're looking at Jesus within uh, ancient Judaism. The one thing I have to say in the beginning is that this is, at a minimum, a semester course. So if you're students here tonight, you should get three credits, okay? Um, and, and I actually oversee a graduate program in ancient Judaism and Christian origins. So not only is it a course, you could actually make it an entire graduate degree, uh, which I think is important. So there are, we have severe limitations tonight in terms of what we're looking at. I'm going to try to go through and just sort of give you some samples of things where that engagement, uh, different fields of study engage the Gospels, engage the historical Jesus, and, and see what it says to us. You may not agree with everything I say tonight. Uh, you may, um, it may not be what you've heard. It may not be the assumptions you bring to the text, which is fine. I always tell my students, it's never an aim of mine that my students agree with me. Uh, that's really not the purpose of, of our study together. Uh, I'm here to sort of promote thought and engagement and thinking about the, the material that's important to, to us. Uh, these are the scriptures and these help determine our lives. So I, I, I want this evening to sort of engage these. And if you're a person who, who falls asleep, uh, I have the main points in the beginning, in the first slide. So you can, you know, you can look on there and then you can, you can watch the video later. Uh, five things that I want you to walk away tonight when you think about what we were, um, what we've talked about this evening. First thing, uh, location, location, location. Geography matters. Where things happen, the context, the physical context is important. The second one, 
Jesus spoke Hebrew. Doesn't sound controversial, but trust me, as a person for over 20 years has been going to SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, when I stand in the hall and speak, I can, be, I can assume correctly that 95% of the people in the hall do not agree with me. The idea that Jesus spoke Hebrew, read Hebrew, spoke Hebrew, is still a very controversial subject in New Testament studies. Um, and again, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, another point right with that, Jesus was literate and educated. Um, it is, you oftentimes hear, maybe not said directly, but the assumption that Jesus was illiterate, could not read, and certainly was not educated. That Galilee was a backwater in the first century, um, and that they were a bunch of country bumpkins up there. Um, and I, I hope to bring a couple things this evening that maybe challenge that idea in terms of our assumptions regarding Jesus. Um, fourth, parables were Jewish, Hebrew, and local. Okay, and we'll sort of address particularly the issues of, of the language of parables. Uh, and we'll, we'll unpack that. Finally, uh, probably something that will challenge us a bit more is that uh, Jesus embraced emerging Judaism of his day. Uh, he lived in a time that was, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, thinking going on. It was a much more uh, robust ideas uh, up until the destruction of the temple. One of the things that happens with the destruction of the temple in 70 is suddenly everyone starts saying, wait a minute, look what happened when we just allowed people to sort of uh, engage this material without any kind of restraints. We got apocalypticism, we got messianism, and look what we got. We got a destroyed holy city and a temple. So there's a difference of attitude post-70 AD and pre-70. But Jesus lived in a, in a period where um, there was, a, I think, a lot more variety of, of thinking and thought. And the question always that Flusser stated was that the question is never whether Jesus was a Jew but what kind of Jew was he? Where does he stand on the landscape of Jewish thought? And that should be a continuing open discussion as we, we understand more and more about the contours of Jewish thought, okay? So again, in the limitations that we have tonight, I'll just have to touch on the tops, and I'm sure that you won't be satisfied with the amount that I'm giving, but my, this is a lot of uh, material to cover, and I'd like to... Uh, just to sort of prick your thinking and maybe plant a seed or two that, that you can continue to look at as you do your own studies, your own research. I picked three, three uh, examples of where geography, um, and again, part of this, I began to be aware, be aware of the importance of geography and setting as I, as I traveled the land, and I, in good Jewish fashion, will I'll start, um, you know, we, we read in the Gospels that, that um, Jesus would go down, this is the middle panel, that Jesus went down from Nazareth to Capernaum in Luke 4.31. And most of us would pass right over that, not look at that, but it's actually quite specific. And if you know anything of the elevations of, uh, of both Nazareth and Capernaum, it's very specific, very detailed. Uh, it's similar to what we find in the Hebrew Bible when we talk about going up to Jerusalem. Uh, because generally, if you're coming from the city of David, the lower stretches of the city, you're always going up. One never goes to the Temple Mount. One never goes to Jerusalem. One always ascends. Uh, and these, these take on a spiritual value to them, but they also have a physical reality to them. And it's no different in the New Testament. The New Testament is also very specific in its uh, geographical uh, details. And um, we can see those again with the just, these are non-theological things. I'm just trying to bring your attention, the elements that are there. Uh, we also read, um, this is a, a more interesting one that very few people comment on. Uh, Jesus is always going to the other side. He's always traveling to the other side. What does that mean, to go to the other side? It's a very relative term in English. Uh, but it's not a relative term in Greek, okay? 
it's always, it's a perspective from the West. He's always going East. Uh, he's always going to the Eastern side. He's going to the, the Transjordanian side. Um, and again, I pulled up a passage here uh, that, that speaks of him. Actually, there are a number of them, but the wording uh, probably in Greek, peron, which is the, the word that we have for the other side, which we get another term, peria. We hear about peria, uh, the Transjordanian, uh, a little bit farther to the south. But we read about it. It's probably derived from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, where it speaks, and Isaiah talks about Evra Yarden, on the other side of the Jordan, beyond the Jordan, which the Septuagint, again, uses the term Peran, and this idea of being the other side. Usually when, when it's specified, when the gospel specify where he's headed, he's almost always headed to Bethsaida, uh, because Bethsaida is on the other side of the Jordan River. Um, the last one, which is a, a more <clears throat> complicated one, I did an article uh, a number of years ago on, on this and published in the, uh, the journal Biblical Literature. Um, if you're leading groups in the country, uh, one of the questions that you're often asked by pilgrims, tourists who are coming there, if you're up north, they always ask the question, when you, you know, you're going around the Sea of Galilee, they go, why do you call this a sea? This is not a sea, it's a lake. And so, uh, you know, you, sometimes if you don't have an answer, if you're guiding groups, leading groups, you don't have an answer, you come up with a very easy answer that sort of satisfies them and move on, even though it's not the real answer. You just sort of, say, you know, you don't say, well, I don't know, just say, well. And so the typical answer that you will hear from individuals, uh, this is the ambiguity of Hebrew. So you always go above their heads by going to another language. <laughs> it's the ambiguity of Hebrew. Yam in Hebrew is a, a large body of water and doesn't specify it being brackish salt water and fresh water, sweet water. And so this is generally for years and years and years. I, this was the answer I sort of, oh, this is the ambiguity of Hebrew. And I've heard other, other guides make the same statement. The problem is, is that when you're writing an atlas and working alongside Anson Rainey, uh, such answers do not, are not allowed. One has to push the envelope and to actually dig in and find out uh, this. And one of the things that I noticed as I began looking at this place name related to this place in the lake is uh, we're center of Jesus' ministry is that not all the Gospels call it the Sea of Galilee. The name Sea of Galilee only appears in Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke, on the other hand, calls it the Lake of Gennesaret, Luke 5.1, which is the name that Josephus tells us is what the local inhabitants calls it. Let me just say for a minute, by the way, let me get, get a footnote in here. Um, there, there are individuals who will tell you that Luke is merely a theological treatment that he's gone in and he's rewritten Mark, and perhaps Matthew, and it's just given us a theological gospel and has no interest whatsoever in physical realities. And that nothing could be more inaccurate. Uh, Luke oftentimes gives us the greatest detail, uh, geographical, to, as a historical geographer of the gospels, I will tell you very often, Luke is the one who is spot on and tells us. Um, because not only does he lack the name Sea of Galilee, he also uh, never calls it a sea. The other Gospels always call it thalassa, sea. Uh, Luke uses another Greek term, limne, which means lake. It's a freshwater lake. Uh, and those actually in classical Greek language have distinctions between them. Thalassa is brackish salt water, and uh, limne is freshwater. So Luke actually gives us an accurate portrayal of the reality of the lake. Uh, the others, again, use this term thalassa. Uh, and of course, before you jump to the conclusion that they are all wrong, uh, they're not wrong, they're just doing something else, the other gospel writers. Uh, and I suggested in the article that the name Sea of Galilee is actually a Christian name. It's a creation 
by the early followers of Jesus. I actually don't think that Jesus knew it by that name. He probably knew it by its biblical name, Yom Kinneret, or either Yom Ginnasar. Um, but he, he didn't know this name, the Sea of Galilee. Instead, I argue that what we have here actually is a, um, if I can use the term, I'm allowed to use it, a Christian midrash. Uh, at least that's what the Israelis tell me. They said, this is a lovely midrash. That they took the verse in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, and you hear about, you know, the one who will come, and it talks about the, the um, it, that's the only place in the entire Hebrew Bible where we have the two words, see, and Galilee appear together in the same verse. And I believe that they collapsed the verse and pulled out those words and created a whole new name uh, from Isaiah 9.1, where it speaks out the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, to signal to those in the community that Yamagalil, whenever they spoke of Yamagalil, the, the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus was ministering around the Sea of Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, uh, next to the Sea of Galilee, that not only what Jesus was doing was fulfilling prophecy, but where he was doing it was fulfilling prophecy. This became a Christian name, again, in all of antiquity, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic. We never have the name outside of Matthew, Mark, and John, never have the name Sea of Galilee, nor do we have that body of water called a sea. It's always called a lake. Only these three writers, and I think they do it by intention. To send a message, it's like an insider speak. It's a way of conveying a deeply held faith about Jesus' ministry and what was accomplished. The, um, we have another story uh, where Jesus uh, go, well, Joseph and Mary take Jesus down into uh, Egypt, you remember that Joseph is warned not to go back, that even though Herod the Great, uh, Herod has died, he's been replaced by his son, who is even more lethal, so he's warned not to go back there. Instead, it, we hear that he goes and he settles in Nazareth. Most of us are not familiar with the geopolitical situation that the, the sort of the, the what color is this? beige color here of Samaria and Judea. This is the region of Archelaus. And look at where he settles. I put a star there, uh, which approximates Nazareth. He actually goes to settle up in the area of Nazareth, which is under the control of Antipas, out of the reach of Archelaus. So there's a geopolitical dynamic in terms of where they settle. Now, yes, they do have roots there. Uh, but there's a dynamic in that story in Matthew's gospel. You see that he's warned in a dream not to go back. So instead, they, <coughs> they circumvent the area of Judea, make their way up north, and settle just beyond the reach of Archelaus. When we talk about the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus is uh, north of the region of the Canaret. The Canaret would be the, the Hebrew name for the lake, the Old Testament name. Uh, and his, his ministry is mostly, actually it's, a lot of it is the picture that we see here, uh, off in the distance, the plain of Gennesaret, and the northern stretches of the Sea of Galilee, uh, what's called the Evangelical Triangle, the three cities that uh, Jesus speaks woes against, uh, Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. Bethsaida and uh, Capernaum are on the lake, uh, Chorazin is slightly up, raised up onto a volcanic sill, slightly to the north. They form sort of a triangle. This is the area that for the bulk of Jesus' ministry, except when he makes his way to the, the area of uh, the plain of Gennesaret. Uh, we actually don't, what's interesting, we actually don't have a single reference to Jesus going to Magdala. Uh, we have no reference. I'm sure he was there. But whenever he goes in that region, it always refers to it as uh, going to Gennesaret, the plain of Gennesaret. Um, we don't have anything about Jesus going to Tiberias, which is uh, sometimes you can draw conclusions from silence. Um, he, uh, I don't think that's an accident. I don't think that would be a place he would spend a lot of time. We hear from Josephus that it was 
a bit of an unseemly place. Um, it was founded as a, a new capital by, by Antipas. Um, he moved the capital from Sipori, from Sepphoris, to, um, to Tiberias, uh, but it, he actually built it on what was a previous graveyard, cemetery, uh, which has purity problems, religious problems, and the only way that he could get people to live there was to bring them by force. Uh, so it's a little bit, Joseph is a little bit critical about the individuals who are there. So the question is, we have people coming out from Tiberias, but we don't, uh, we don't actually, um, and they may have been at the hot springs. There are hot springs uh, south of Tiberias. Uh, a lot of times people would come for skin ailments, other things that they would draw them there seeking healing. And we can, we can understand why they would hear about this man on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee and would be drawn to there. Uh, and it seems that they came out to Jesus, but we don't have, we have no single reference of Jesus uh, visiting Tiberias during his ministry. When we look at Jesus' work around the Sea of Galilee, primarily he's up in the north and the west. Um, this gives you sort of a, an idea of the layout. Uh, most of his work, again, along the shores of the north, north and western side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we don't have him venturing very far south around the lake. Uh, the only time that we do uh, is the story of um, the story after the storm on the lake, and they ended up at a, a location that's marked on the map here. Uh, forget the best state, I didn't do that map. Uh, and I don't know why in the world they put Bethsaida question mark uh, on the, you know, if you're looking at it, if this is like a clock, it would be about two o'clock, almost three o'clock on the lake. Uh, but right around there is the place, uh, south of it is Kursi, Gergesa, uh, which is in the area of Gentile population. We have a heavy Greek Gentile population living on the southern part of the uh, shores of the Sea of Galilee on the east. Um, and this is why when Jesus comes, we hear about people who are raising swine and always the question, why are they, you know, what are Jews doing raising, raising pigs, raising swine? These are probably not Jews. Um, I, I, again, I don't think it's a coincidence that this happens after the storm. Uh, perhaps they were blown off course. I, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but it sort of makes sense to me. It seems the one occasion he sort of ventures to the east and south, which is traditionally the area of, um, of Gentiles. Um, they typically, we have, we have Greeks coming to him, we have individuals seeking him out, but this is not an area that he, he focuses on. Most of it is actually in the north and western part of the lakes where he spends most of his time, where I think you would find uh, a heavier concentration with people who have a religious orientation. Um, this seems to be where where he spends most of his time in his ministry. Again, the one time to the south and the east is the place of Gergesa or Kursi. Um, this is one of my favorite ones for uh, text critics, those who deal in Greek manuscripts. Uh, your Bibles read there that uh, in the parallel passages that Jesus either came to Gadara, Matthew's um, 8.28, or Gerasa, Mark 5.1, or Luke 8, 26. Um, this is a really interesting textual critical problem. We have manuscripts all over the place, reading Gerasa or Gadara. Um, I'm a historical geographer. Uh, Jesus would not have arrived at, e at either place. Uh, if you look at the map, I've underlined the, the red. Gadara is much farther to the south. Gerasa, uh, even farther down in the middle of the desert. Uh, you don't go by boat from one side of the lake to the other and arrive 30 miles south in the desert. Um, and I have, I have discussions with, you know, Greg, friends of mine who are text critics, they go, but the best manuscripts read, I go, it doesn't matter. Uh, the best manuscripts are, they may have the best readings, the best manuscripts may have that reading, but geography trumps here. Uh, and the, the, what's, it's quite simple. There was another name, Gergesa, which Greek scribes in the early century, we're not talking about the autographs, we're talking about centuries on, encounter this, this unusual name, Gergesa, which no one had ever heard of, um, and they replaced the unknown with the known. 
because you have these famous decapolis city of Gadar and Gerasa, so they, they felt fr free to correct the text, the Greek scribes do, and give us, again, this reading of Gerasa or, or Gadara, so we have the Gadarene demoniac or the Gerasene demoniac, uh, but he doesn't arrive at either one of those places. He arrives at a place known as Gergesa, um, on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in the area of the Decapolis. And so, again, this is a time where geography, and we could spend this evening or an entire course talking about how the geography of the Lamb shapes our reading of the text. Jesus spoke Hebrew. This is still one of the most controversial um, issues that you, for me as a New Testament scholar, a gospel scholar, uh, that I encounter, and it's seminal. It's very, very important. It's like a watershed point. If you're not with me on this, then we're, we're going to have problems. Um, I believe it, uh, that it remains one of the most tenacious, persistent, outdated, and erroneous inventions of the 19th century. Um, that Hebrew was a dead language or nearly dead language. Sometimes they'll treat it like medieval Latin that people are running around you know, and using it in synagogues. They'll use Hebrew, but no place else. Um, we did, a few years ago, I did a volume with, uh, edited a volume with a man named Randall Booth. Uh, and the volume uh, the work was the, the language environment of first century Judea. We did a collection of articles um, and really demonstrated, I think, that Hebrew should be brought back into consideration in terms of a language. Jesus lived in a trilingual, land, at least three languages. Um, Hebrew was the distinctive language of the Jewish people, but you have influences from the East that brought Aramaic, you have influences from the West that brought Greek, and so it's a very fluid land. I think, I personally think Jesus knew all three. I think there's evidence in the text that Jesus was, was multilingual, he wasn't an American, he knew more than one language, uh, and I, I the, the, the Greek one, if you're interested, I think the Greek one is because some of his, some of his parables have influences, uh, look like Aesop's fables, and uh, the, uh, they, they look like they're influenced by Aesop's fables or that he's familiar with them. And uh, the young boys, oftentimes, that's how they would immerse them in Greek, is by reading these fables and learning Greek inductively. And so I, I would suggest that Jesus was a multilingual, but certainly he knew Hebrew. Um, it's usually not very pleasant, and I don't, when I'm in academic circles, I don't mention it because it can be misunderstood, but the, there's no question that the origins of an Aramaic only speaking Jesus has very um, unhealthy uh, motivations behind it. Uh, grew out of the continent uh, in the 19th century and early 20th century, and to put it as gently as I can, if Jesus speaks Aramaic, he can still be a good Aryan. But if he speaks Hebrew, he must be a Jew. And so you, and we had a couple of articles in this volume. Uh, it's Brill, by the way. I don't know if you don't have it in your library, you should. We had a German scholar with us who, who wrote an article in which he went through quote by quote by quote. And it's very clear what the motivation is. Um, and he translated them to demonstrate that the, 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 those who were in the beginning, so I'm not talking about today. Today, people will say it because that's just what they were taught and that's how they move forward. Uh, but the origins of that uh, were very unhealthy and uh, motivated by things that I, I don't think many people would embrace today. The idea is, but still it's perpetuated, this idea of an Aramaic only speaking Jesus. Again, I don't have any problem with Jesus speaking Aramaic, but it's the idea that he, that's all he spoke. And so um, usually it's, uh, it gets to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, and again, if you want to read a couple of articles for the students who are here, James Barr, uh, who was a brilliant scholar, Oxford, uh, wrote in his article on Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, he sort of scored New Testament scholars for ignoring Hebrew as a spoken language in the first century. Uh, more recently, St uh, Stephen Fosberg, uh, from the Hebrew University, wrote the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, what languages did Jesus speak? Again, arguing that Hebrew should be brought into consideration. Um, if nothing else, the Dead Sea Scrolls should have long since put this to rest. We have inscriptions, we have trilingual inscriptions, we have inscriptions in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek in our period of time. 
Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls, you would think, should have uh, put this to rest. Um, Martin Abegg, it's a good friend of mine, uh, estimates that of the 700 non-biblical texts from the Qumran Library, 120 are written in Aramaic, 28 in Greek, and 550 scrolls are written in Hebrew. Okay? One of the more fascinating ones I love is the, the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is where they went through the Hebrew, the Isaiah Scroll, and they updated the Hebrew. In other words, you had, you had you know, out-of-date Hebrew expressions, and they wanted to give a more contemporary sort of good news for modern man, or good, good Hebrew for modern, modern Jews. And they, they updated the Hebrew within the Isaiah Scroll. It's a living language. And, the, and yet, it's, it's skipped over. People sort of ignore the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls for understanding the, the language environment in the first century. Um, all the scrolls, even more than the numerical value, all the scrolls penned at Kirbit Qumran were in Hebrew. The Aramaic scrolls came from outside. All those that are penned at Qumran, are written, inscribed at Qumran, are all in Hebrew. Okay? Um, and more than that, and this is a more interesting thing, and... Uh, Former student of mine who's at McMaster, uh, Dan Mashila, is doing work on this. And he pointed out to me the other day is that what happens is that there's, there's a trend. The earlier scrolls, again, that came outside of the community are Aramaic. But as we move into the second century, it's all Hebrew. And usually, probably what's happening is that with the Maccabean, Hasmonean revolt and nationalism, Hebrew is reborn, just like we saw in the 20th century. Hebrew is... It, there were people who knew Hebrew, but it takes on old, and it becomes the dominant, prominent language in the land of Israel. So uh, these things, again, set as a, as a backdrop. For those who ask the question, who cares, or what difference does it make, I uh, threw very, uh, a handful of very simple of examples uh, of what difference does it make that Jesus spoke Hebrew. Just a couple of expressions. Again, this could be an entire lecture in and of itself. In Matthew 16, 17, we hear Jesus refer to, to t say to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. The expression, basar vidam, means a human. It's, it's a Hebrew expression. It's not good Greek. It's good Hebrew uh, that, that shows up in, uh, shows up in the uh, Gospel of Matthew and also some Jewish Greek literature that we know is translated, had a, an earlier Hebrew uh, version of it. And Matthew 20, 15, this isn't how it reads in your Bible. Uh, that this is not how they translate it. The translators are sort of trying to give you the sense of it. Uh, but in the end, when the owner of the vineyard, he literally asks those who are complaining about what they get paid, he, he says, is your eye evil? And this expression, ayin ra, means greedy, stingy. Because they're complaining because others got paid the same as they did. Again, it's a Hebrew expression. It's not, uh, is not a, it's not, it, it's something that we, it's not good Greek. We have in Matthew 5, 17, and this one will be a little bit harder for you. Uh, for some of you who have your, your theology pinned on, on uh, Martin Luther, um, that he, Jesus speaks in Matthew 5, 17, unless your righteousness ex exceeds the scribes and Pharisees. By the first century in Hebrew, this expression tzedakah meant charity. If you've, been to this, if you've been to Jerusalem, you're going down the steps, those people there with the little red strings, and they want you to give something, and they'll tie that for good luck around it, they're all saying tzedakah, tzedakah, charity, charity. It becomes an expression meaning charity, not legal righteousness or rightness. He's basically saying Unless your faith translates into a change of life such that you concern yourself with the material welfare of others, then you have no place in this movement. Jesus was looking at people, for people who not only got right with God, but looked to others and the concerns of others, that it translated and reshaped how they oriented their lives, not just spiritually, but also materially, people who were in need. And we find this expression again and again. Uh, if you look carefully 
at the description of Cornelius. He was a man who feared God and gave liberally to the poor. At the end of that story, what does Peter say? I now understand how true it is that uh, God is no respecter of people, but anyone who fears him and does righteousness. That does righteousness, which is not how it's translated in your Bible, but it literally in Greek it says does righteousness, is tied back to the description of Cornelius, that he was a man who feared God and gave to the poor. So we, again, and we could set and go through a number of examples of this, where Hebrew is shaping the Greek that's there that undergirds what we're reading. Finally, in the, in the version, Matthean version of the Lord's, uh, Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our debts. By the first century, chov, chovot, uh, meant trespasses, sin. This is a Hebrew expression that takes hold and um, is in shapes and influences. We have a number of parables. I'm, all, I'm very interested in parables. In the parables, when Jesus speaks about debt, it's always about sin and forgiveness, unfailingly. Uh, and it's, it's key to our understanding. What's fascinating is that all these expressions are post-biblical Hebraisms. Post-biblical Hebraisms. Hebrew is alive. It's changing all the time. Think of the expressions that we use today that 50 years ago had a completely different idea to them, attached to it. Uh, language is always moving, and it's changing, and it's no different. I gave a lecture a number of years ago at the Lanier Library. As it was called between the chairs, which is itself a Hebrew expression. It means between the cracks. And it was, the idea was that there are Hebraisms in the New Testament that are overlooked. They fall between the cracks because... New Testament scholars do not know Hebrew, so they don't pick up on them. And Hebrew scholars, Old Testament scholars, have no interest in the Gospels. They don't spend their time looking at it, so no one sees these. And I presented the idea that the New Testament, as a first century document, is like a window. You're watching Hebrew changing as it's going by you. So you see actually late biblical Hebrew, and you see early examples of what becomes rabbinic Hebrew. In the New Testament, the New Testament is a repository of these changes in language. But again, I would argue quite strongly, and I've done a couple of articles on this. I did an article on, on, um, on, on Hebraisms in the Gospels. Uh, it was called um, Sept Non-Septuagental Hebraisms, which is a mouthful. Non-Septuagental Hebraisms in the Gospels. Uh, and then I did another one also looking at Jesus' exegesis, which is based in Hebrew. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move into to this. Most, not, not most, a number of scholars assume that Jesus was illiterate, that he just sort of walked around, did miracles, pithy little sayings, and things like that. But the suggestion that he was educated, or that anybody in the Galilee was educated, uh, is, is generally a, a bit of a stretch. Um, what's fascinating is that in the Gospels, um, not only is Jesus portrayed as one who could read the Hebrew Bible, he's also presented with a knowledge of contemporary Jewish hermeneutical methods. We actually teach a course on Jewish hermeneutical method and the New Testament. Uh, it's not hermeneutics like we, we teach in the seminary. The Jews, they, they interpret the, the principles for interpretation are different. The way they go about dealing with the text is different than what we do. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, they're just different and how they approach the text. It's very language-based, which I'm back at Hebrew again. It's very important to know that, that Jesus is engaging uh, in Hebrew text. And they, sometimes you'll hear it suggested, oh, this is just the creation of the post-Easter church. Uh, this is the redactor who's, who's making these things up. We have no one else in the landscape of the early church, no one who's presented with the expertise that we find Jesus being portrayed. In other words, if it's not him, we have some person who's back there that we know nothing about who's demonstrating incredible skill in their handling of Scripture. It's consistently always Jesus uh, who's presented in this fashion. And again, I don't want to get into the whole Paul-Jesus debate. Uh, you brought up Paul, but the, I, I just have to say that Paul could not hold a candle to Jesus. Jesus' education, his handling of text, far surpasses Paul. 
I know as evangelicals, we get sort of bothered by that because much of our theology is built upon Pauline writings. But trust me, Jesus was far superior in his education and his handling of text. That would come from Jewish scholars. I get that right from the Jewish guy. Not because they're prejudiced against Paul, but just looking at it and how he handles the text. So what I'd like to do is to give an example of the type of ways in which Jesus deals with the Scripture, uh, Jewish interpretive methods in the New Testament, um, the one called Gezra Shavah. And uh, it's one of Hillel, Hillel the Great, who was the generation before Jesus, the leading sage of his generation. Um, he, he gave seven midot, seven interpretive principles. Um, and the, the passage that we hear, there's a couple places that we read about it in rabbinic literature, but it says, seven rules of interpretation Hillel the Elder expounded before B'nai Batira, the sons of Batira. Um, and we, we see this all the time, but we don't recognize it. I always tell my students, pay attention when Jesus speaks in half verses. We always got him speaking in half, you know, a house should be called a house of prayer, but you've called a den of thieves. If you go look and try to find that verse, you find it as two verses. And he does this all the time. He's always combining, stringing verses together. And it's not haphazard, folks. There's a certain method that goes about the interpretation of Scripture. Uh, and it's, again, it's based on the thing about Hebrew exegesis, Hebrew hermeneutics. It's based upon uh, verbal analogies, words. And it's very closely uh, tied to what's written in the text. And we find Jesus doing it on a number of occasions. Some of the most famous ones you know, of course, uh, in Luke chapter 10 in the parallels, when he's, he's asked about, you know, which is the greatest commandment, and the response uh, is from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, you shall love the Lord your God. And then the other one, uh, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Um, why? One, the content. You would say the answer is, is content. It's a good answer. It's, it's, it's central. But there's something more than that. The reason those verses, and not just in the Gospels, not just in the New Testament, but outside among um, Jewish thinkers, Jewish writers, they're always combining those together, is that they're linked verbally. It has nothing to do with concept. It has to do with verbiage, <laughs> words. Those are two of the three times Two of the three phrases that we find in the Hebrew Bible where a command begins, Ve'ahavta, and you shall love. Deuteronomy 6.5, Leviticus 19, 18b, they begin with that same command, and you shall love. Okay? Uh, and this is what allows uh, Jewish scholars to, to combine those things together. Um, in essence, it's, it's not a... A word game, it actually is an in, a process of interpretation. It's reading one passage through the lens of the other. There's an interpretation. How do you love God? By loving your neighbor. It should be demonstrated in how you relate to each other. So they're not just sort of slapping them together because they're happy to be. There's also a thoughtfulness that goes about in this, in that process of combining these passages. Um, and of course, the end of that story is this, you know, he asks, you know, who is my neighbor? And we, we go into the, the, the long story of the Samaritan there, and there are lots of questions as to uh, why that story is there, what function does it have. Um, I've written, and I, I think it's at least worth, worth giving some thought to, that what we have here is actually the, in a narrative form, the embodiment of the third commandment to love. The two that I mentioned before are two of three. There's a third one a few verses later in, Luke, in Leviticus 19. In Leviticus 19, 34, it speaks of the stranger, the one outside of your community. So we've already got it that we, we love God and we love our neighbor. We love those who are within our circle. So when the person says, well, who's my neighbor? Who can I exclude from that? Jesus gives us a story about a people who are living in hostility towards the Jews. Josephus tells us that there, were, there was violence. So some things never change. You know, you can't, it's not, it's not always safe to do arriving through the West Bank these days, uh, difficulties, hostilities. In some ways, it, you had similar situations in the first century, tensions between the Samaritans and the Jews. So it's probably not an accident that Jesus picks a Samaritan in this story. There are other dynamics in that story going on, 
I think it's interesting that he picks the Samaritan. In Leviticus 19.34, it speaks of the foreigner, the alien, and you should love him as yourself. So three people, or three entities, we love God, we love those that are within our community, and we love those who are outside our community who might even be hostile against us. Remember once I was talking to a Jewish friend of mine in Jerusalem, a scholar, and I mentioned that, and said, impossible. No one ever exploits the three, takes advantage of the three commandments to love. We have no other sage do that. To which I responded, do we have any other sage who says, love those who hate you, love your enemies? It's, I think they're, they come out of the same, same motivation. That we're, but again, these are held together by this exegesis. Another example more familiar to you is Jesus' encounter in Nazareth. We have the story, this one's rich. We could, do the whole, could have done the whole evening on this one tonight. Uh, we have Jesus coming to the synagogue. It says, as was his custom. I always tell my students, Jesus never went to church, uh, but he did go to synagogue. Uh, so he comes into the synagogue. Uh, what's amazing about this story in Luke's gospel, it is so full of historical detail. We were talking this evening at dinner, I was with one of the students. We were talking about what went in, on in the synagogue. We have no prayer in the synagogue in the Second Temple period, pre-70. We have not one mention in Jewish sources, Christian sources, of prayer. In the, it doesn't mean it's forbidden, but it wasn't the focal point for communal prayer like we have today in the Jewish community. Instead, it was the place of study. What we have is we have people wanted to study the scriptures. People didn't walk around with a Bible. They didn't have their King James with them. They, they, if you wanted to study the scripture, you had to go where the scripture existed. So they would go to the synagogue. Where, where at least a portion of the scriptures were. Not all of them, usually, not all 39 books, but they would have parts of them. And they would uh, read them together, they would study together. And it's interesting, we find Jesus going to the synagogue. It says, as was his custom. And we have him standing to read and sitting to unpack, to preach. Uh, which is exactly, if you've been to Chorazin, you see the seat there, sometimes referred to as the seat of Moses, the seat of instruction. Uh, exactly the sort of the, the description that we have of Jesus fits what we would expect. Um, and he begins to read from the book of Isaiah. This is the first time in history we have a record, a report of the reading of the prophets in the synagogue. Today in every Jewish synagogue, there will be a reading from the Torah, followed by the reading of the Haftarah, the reading from the prophets. That tradition is not, we don't hear about it in the Old Testament period. We don't have any records of it in the intertestamental period. It may have gone on, we just don't have records of it. But the very first account we have is Jesus reading from Isaiah in the synagogue. We also have mentioning of it in the, uh, in the um, mentioning of, of reading of them in the book of Acts. But again, this is the first occasion. And it's the first of a number of, of occasions that we find uh, witnesses to Jewish life and faith in the first century, in the second temple period. Jewish scholars are, as you mentioned, are becoming more comfortable in reading the New Testament and seeing it as a source for the history, life, and faith of Jewish people in the second temple period. They recognize that there are things that are there that, that shed light in the development of Jewish practice. Um, the other couple of them I'll throw out, uh, the, today in Jewish tradition, when your son is born, he's not named. He has no name uh, for his first eight days. Then he is circumcised. At his circumcision, he's named. That Jewish custom, which happens universally in all Jewish families, the first time we have that report, John the Baptist. Second one, Jesus. They're the first time in history we have a report of the naming of the son at their circumcision. Uh, we have uh, the limits of, of Sabbath journeys, travels. Uh, I don't know how it is in Charlotte, but I know where I am. We have a wire up on the uh, telephone poles, the marking of the Eruv, the edges of the community limiting how far you can go on the Sabbath outside of the, uh, the going a Sabbath day journey. First witness we have of that, Book of Acts. The New Testament is a witness to the developments of Jewish life in the first century. I would argue, some would disagree, that the mentioning of Timothy and Paul's requiring him to be circumcised was because his mother was Jewish. 
uh, and maybe the first evidence we have of matrilineal identity, uh, identifying your nationality by your mother, something that is universally done today in the Jewish community. Uh, but it, if you ask them, when did that begin? Uh, no one can point to it because it's not really an Old Testament idea, something that seems to develop later. Jesus and his reading, uh, he has a very interesting reading where he's reading Isaiah 61, which everybody knows, uh, but he fits into it a line from Isaiah 58, 6, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's not in Isaiah 61. And uh, commentaries sort of, sort of pour over it, they, you'll read everything from Lucas mistaken to, you know, the, the, all kinds of ideas of why this sort of fits this one line in this, you know, Luke was confused, didn't really know, his sources didn't know what they were talking about. Hogwash. This is actually a very, evidence of a very sophisticated handling of scripture by intention. Jesus is bringing together, just like we talked about earlier, the example of Gezra Shaphat, Jesus bringing together of two passages of Scripture and bringing them, reading one through the lens of the other. What allows him to do that is the, is the um, phrase, Ratzon Ladonai, the Lord's favor, that appears in both of those. Only in those two passages, in the entire Hebrew Bible, do we find the phrase, the thread, the verbal thread that allowed Jesus to combine those two passages uh, in those two verses, Ratzon Ladonai. It allows him, and the theme of it is the Lord's favor. That's what he's speaking about, the nature of God's redemption. What is it going to look like? Isaiah 61 in the first century had tended to be read. It has sort of a natural dualism to it, uh, an us and them, two camps, uh, those whom God favors and those who he will punish with his vengeance, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor for some and the day of vengeance uh, of our God. And so the verse itself has sort of this intrinsic dualism. It's not negative. It just speaks of two sides of a coin. Um, that, and, but it was interpreted that God would reward some and punish others. His favor is for some, his judgment for others. Accordingly, at Qumran, Qumran loved this passage, and they read it, uh, interpreting to the, the end days, uh, they called their members to likewise follow God's example and to love those that God loves and to hate those that God hates. And they anticipated the coming of a, of a priestly Messiah who would um, punish those who were outside the community, those who were not part of them. That The identity of that individual was Melchizedek. They believed that Melchizedek would come back. Let me just state, because sometimes it's overstated, the, uh, the connections between the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and Jesus. I actually think that the, it, the Dead Sea Scrolls are very helpful for understanding something of the background of the first century setting, but in terms of worldview, Jesus could not be farther away from the type of mentality that we find in the scrolls. I think he speaks uh, clearly to that spiritual dualism that existed there uh, when he states, you have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's almost verbatim, right out of the community rule, where it says that you love those that God loves and hate those that God hates. But Jesus told his followers, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray to those who persecute you. Uh, So he sort of rejected that type of us and them uh, mentality that existed there. Instead, Jesus' response was that they should exhibit God's mercy. And he uses God's example in the past uh, where with the story of the widow of Serapath and Syrian, the Naaman the Syrian, these are two in- individuals who were outside of the covenant people of Israel. They were not inside. They were not favored. They were people that God should have ignored. They're outside of the covenant. And Jesus brings them as examples that God's mercy extended beyond what they would assume is a prejudice, you know, that they would be prejudiced against them. Why, why is God concerning himself with these individuals? And I think Jesus is bringing this as weight to the weight of divine mercy sort of crushes our prejudice. That God's attention was given to the undeserving, those who others said, you know, why, why should God be concerned with him at all? They're outside of the covenant. Jesus' message in Nazareth was that they should be merciful as God the Father is merciful. Um, 
He does it by, again, using this passage from Isaiah 58, as well as truncating his reading of Isaiah 61. If you read there, you'll see he leaves out the last line. He doesn't include the day of vengeance of our God, because he wasn't bringing vengeance. That wasn't his message. Doesn't mean that there's not judgment, but not now. His message was something else. And he was encouraging them by bringing Isaiah 58, rather than sitting and judging those who were outside of their congregation, perhaps those who didn't agree with him, those they didn't like, maybe even those who were outside of the people of Israel. Instead, he brings the message of Isaiah 58, that they should roll up their sleeves and actually exemplify the mercy of God, the love of God. Taken from Isaiah 58, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring, homeless, uh, bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. There's that word righteousness again. Righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. It's interesting, at the end of the story, uh, they rise up and they take Jesus out preparing to stone him. It's fascinating, we have almost a direct parallel with an individual named Choni the Circle Drawer. Uh, he got caught in between a, a civil war uh, among the last vestiges of the Maccabean dynasty uh, where they asked him to pray for one side against the other. And they wanted him to curse the other side, uh, and sort of like the whole story of Balaam. It's very similar to the story of Balaam, uh, except this is a Jewish civil war. He refused to do that. And he, he actually prayed, and he said, ignore both their prayers. Uh, and, he, and he refused to get caught to that type of dualism, that separation of saying those are deserve, some are deserving and some are not deserving. And what was the response? They took him out and stoned him. People get very upset when you start... Uh, messing with their categories, uh, with their pigeonholes, their systems of thought. Quickly on parables, um, parables are Jewish, Hebrew, and local. Uh, if you want to read more on it, I wrote a, an article uh, about a year and a half ago, appeared in the, Jew the Journal for the Study of the New Testament, reading gospel parables as Jewish literature. Uh, within that, I put down what I consider seven categories of Jewish parables that we we can't really start talking about parables until we, um, we're agreed on certain uh, aspects of them. The term, the term parable in Hebrew, uh, mashal, is a post-biblical Hebrewism. It's interesting. Nobody picks this up. In the Old Testament Hebrew, mashal is a, um, is a proverb, a prophecy, something of that nature. Uh, but the two or three story parables we have in the Old Testament are not called mashalim. They're not called parables. Um, when the first time we ever encounter the term parable to describe a story parable is in the Gospels, interestingly enough. Again, once again, a repository of, of the developments of, of Hebrew language, of Jewish language. Um, secondly, the genre of story parables limited the Gospels in rabbinic literature. Uh, even among the Jews, if I look at Josephus, Philo, intertestamental literature, apocalyptic, Jewish apocalyptic literature, um, all the various types of literature we have in the Second Temple period, no parables. They show up in rabbinic literature. Uh, they're, they're in rabbinic literature and the Gospels, which may tell us something about where Jesus stands on the landscape of Jewish thought. I always find it amazing, C.H. Dodd, could write a book on parables of the kingdom, dealing with gospel parables, specifically those dealing with the kingdom of heaven, that he could write an entire volume on parables dealing with the kingdom of heaven and not a genre that only appears in rabbinic literature in the gospels, about a phrase, machut shamayim, that only appears in rabbinic literature in the Gospels. Again, doesn't appear in apocalyptic literature, Qumran, any place, only in rabbinic literature. He could write an entire volume and never cite a single rabbinic work. You just completely ignore that and we start as if Jesus is uh, working in a vacuum. Um, all parables are in Hebrew. I delivered a paper a few years ago at SBL and someone said I sucked the air out of the room. Uh, it was a Jesus, historical Jesus session. We were talking about, I said, 
All parables are Hebrew, no exception, no exception. And I said, I'm the only person here who's translated all 456 of the earliest Jewish parables. And I'm here to tell you there's not a single Aramaic parable. And in Jewish tradition, you never tell parables in Aramaic. You always tell them in Hebrew. Even in the parts of the Talmud that are in Aramaic, when it comes to telling a parable, it goes back to Hebrew. It's a sociolinguistic dynamic that happens in, in people groups that they, certain functions are in certain languages. And Hebrew, all parables are in Hebrew. And yet, if you open all of the literature that's written about the parables of Jesus, they will all say uniformly that Jesus' parables are in Aramaic. And I said, if Jesus told parables in the Aramaic, he's the only Jew in history to ever do so. <laughs> there's not a single one. It's not like there's more. Majority, it's like zero. They're, they don't exist. Okay? The, um, the, again, number four, characteristics. Uh, the settings for the pair, this is a bit of a, uh, may seem like a bit of a, an anomaly, but the setting of the story parables are not distinctively Jewish. Even the rabbinic parables. In other words, they're about a father and his son, two brothers, a king and his subjects, a master and his workers, um, a variety of subjects. They could be Norwegian. They could be, there's no, nothing, there's no, there are no rabbis, there's no temple, there's no dealing with Jewish law. Everything is, is, is can, there's no, anything distinctively Jewish about the parables, not only in the Gospels, but also in rabbinic literature. Um, parables are, and this one is, parables are conduits of wisdom and are never told to keep secrets. This is, this is something as a mistaken notion often among Christians that Jesus told parables so no one could understand what he was saying. Those, those outside, it was in order to keep it just for insiders that no one could understand what he was talking about. Uh, that is not the function of parables. Parables are told to make simple to take concepts like the kingdom of heaven and bring it down to very earthly terms um, that, that normal people, regular people, non-scholars could get. And in fact, uh, parables are not the product of study, of erudition. Uh, the, the rabbis actually, although you have them telling them, they did not hold the parable in high esteem because it's not a product of, of years and years of study in the, in the yeshiva or the Beit Midrash. Anybody who tells a good story can tell a parable. And so it doesn't require all that, all that time. So they didn't really hold them in very high esteem. And it's fascinating that we don't have Jesus telling parables in the synagogue, which is the place of study. If you look at where they're told, we're back at setting now in context. He tells the parables at dinner, walking on the way, encounters, but he doesn't tell it in the place of study. It's not, it's not the product of that environment. Um, and parables reflect the, often reflect the, uh, spiritual priorities of the Hurley Hasidim. This is a group that in New Testament studies, doubtless you will never come across. There are only a handful of people who actually write on them. It's a very interesting thing that we, we sort of look over this group. Uh, this was a movement, a pietistic movement that, that began in the first century BC and, and begins to wane and, and disappears in the second century AD. Um, it was located in the Galilee, Hasidim. The word means pious or faithful. Uh, these were individuals who, who had a special dedication to God, and, and associated with them are miracles, healings, exorcisms, all the things that you associate with Jesus. Do you realize that rabbis never do healings, exorcisms, miracles? It's always the Hasidim. Uh, we have their miracles, but we don't have their teaching because they were at times at odds with the sages, the Pharisees of their day. And so while they were held in high esteem for their miracles, their teaching was sort of buried. Again, once again, everything we know about them, we know from the rabbis who were very careful about what they tell us about them. Um, but they, they put, particularly they put a strong emphasis upon uh, charity, upon relationships with others, taking care with others, to the extent that they, they ran into problems with the Pharisees, the sages of their day, uh, they were particularly drawn to the marginalized. And there are issues of ritual purity. You can't maintain that ritual purity in engaging the sick, the poor, the, the, those who are on the margins of the religious community. Uh, and so there are tensions. And the areas of tensions are exactly the, the same tensions that we find Jesus uh, at tensions with the Pharisees. Uh, finally, Jesus embraced 
the emerging Judaism of his day. Jesus grew up in a home that took seriously the commandments. Um, all kinds of stories. We read about Mary, their time of purification. She goes up in the temple. Do you realize that Mary, she goes up to offer the offering. She could have waited six months. She could have waited a couple of years. She could have waited till, with no, no pressure. She could have waited till she had other children going up to offer this offering. Mary goes up on the first day she's allowed to go. Jewish scholars would tell you this is a high degree of piety. A woman who goes up on the very first day she can to offer an offering in the temple. We hear about the pilgrimage. His family brought, came up from pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem in Luke 2.41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. Jewish scholars would tell you that's an extraordinarily high degree of piety. They were usually expected to go once. I know we have it in the, in the Old Testament. We, we hear it should go three times a year up here before the Lord. But practically speaking, by the time we get the second temple period, people are not doing that. If you live in Corinth, if you live in Ephesus, or even in Galilee, what it takes to go three times a year, it's not just going yet. It's preparation, everything involved. It became impractical. So people who lived right around Jerusalem were required to come. But those outside were not required to come up three times a year. And you were expected usually once in a lifetime, sort of like the Muslims with the Hajj, go once in a lifetime. So when you have Jesus' family going up every year for Passover, if Shemuel Safrai was here, he would tell you, this, this marks of a very high degree of piety. Jesus grew up in a family that loved the scriptures. He was raised in that environment. Um, and, and Jesus seems to have continued it. You continue to find him coming on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, and he, growing up in that, he embraced the innovations that are going on in his day. It always amazes me when people talk about Jesus, uh, you know, you start talking about the you know, Jewish background to the Gospels or Jewish background to Jesus. People want to uh, talk, just talk about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And I, I point out, I said, this, Jesus was a person of his time. There are, we speak of Jesus coming in the fullness of time. What does that mean? That means God the Father knew what he was doing when his son is born in the second temple period. There, there is emerging Jewish thought. There are changes going on that Jesus is part of, that he's taking advantage of and utilizing him. Jesus was not, if I can say it, Jesus was not a Sinai Jew. He's, he's those who are part of taking the written scripture and interpreting it and applying it in a very complex world. He lived in a time of military occupation. Uh, there were all kinds of questions that were being asked in his day, and he embraced those. He, he engaged those. And sometimes he's one of the clearest voices of, of, of his day in terms of how his contemporaries address those issues. One of the more powerful ones, which I love very much, is the idea of the image of God, which we all talk about today. I don't think people appreciate the contribution of first century Jewish thought developments that are going on that sort of come because Jesus embraced those as well, have come to influence so much of our thinking today. Do you realize that we, we talk about, you know, everybody has created the image of God. That, we only hear that in the book of Genesis. We only hear in Genesis that God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Uh, and then once again in Genesis 9, 6, then the Bible goes silent about us being born in his image. It's not an idea that's repeated. It's not until we move into uh, the second century, probably as a consequence of events uh, with the persecutions under Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, there's sort of a crisis of faith. Pretty much every major trend that I find going on in the first century, I can trace back to that. It's like an upheaval that, that, that happens uh, that in that period of time. Our ideas of afterlife, resurrection, hell, get much more defined coming out of that because you certainly want something to punish those, those wicked people who are executing and martyring uh, the Jewish nation. Uh, you, you want hope. So ideas, it's not that resurrection and, and, and uh, ideas of the afterlife 
did not exist prior to that. They get far more defined by those events. We have a number of ideas that, that get accentuated. And one of the ideas that we start hearing out of that is the idea that we're created in God's image. It's something that we share. We hear it in, the, um, in Ben Sira, uh, and that the, he created it. And, and created everyone in his own image. And that, particularly among the Hasidim, got reinforced with the idea that every person had value, the value of one. It's, it's called the teaching of the Hasidim, but there's a principle that if your city is surrounded by the Romans and, the, uh, the, and you have within your city a criminal, someone that they're chasing, and they offer to you that if you turn over the criminal, there's no question about his guilt. But if you turn over the criminal, you're allowed, uh, we'll leave you alone. We won't do any harm. But if you don't, we'll kill every man, woman, and child. According to the principle of the Hasidim, you're not allowed to turn him over. The value of a single life, the value of the individual. And this is an idea that penetrates, again, into rabbinic Judaism. And I think also we can see it reflected in the teaching of Jesus the, uh, in Mishnah Sanhedrin, it says, therefore, a single man was created in the world. In other words, the idea that God created Adam, and from Adam he brought Eve, and from Adam and Eve, everyone is created. A single man was created in the world to teach that if anyone destroys a single soul, I'm emphasizing words there, um, it is reckoned to him as if he destroyed the whole world. And if he saves a single soul, it is reckoned to him as if he saved the whole world. Now those key terms, and this is where I come back to my fixation on language and echoes that we find in the text, I think are undergirding Jesus' response when a man with a withered hand is brought out on the Sabbath. And the question is, is he going to heal him or not? What's going to happen here? And Jesus asks the question, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a soul or to destroy it? Same key words. I think we hear an echo of Jesus giving this sentiment that the value of this individual is such that God, the Father, will not wait another day. Because if you ask, he puts out his hand and he's healed. And I usually ask my students or if I'm on a tour, I said, who broke the Sabbath? And they'll say, well, maybe the man. I said, There's nothing in the law about sticking your hand out. You can stick your hand out on the Sabbath. So well, what about Jesus? I said, he didn't lay hands on him. He didn't do anything. There's nothing there to break the Sabbath. Who breaks the Sabbath? God. God does work healing. To, but what they're, what they're astounded by is that God the Father gives his imprimatur to this idea by healing the man with the withered hand. It's God is, is saying, that's right. This person is so valuable to me, they have such value in my eyes, they should not have to wait another day. And his hand was restored. And it says they went out perplexed. Went out, they were filled with confounding. This is another, this is a problem I have with the translation in that text. The translators translated, they were filled with fury, anger. Never in the history of Greek language, ever in the history of Greek language, is annoya. Translated as fury, anger, wrath. It's always confounding, bafflement. This is where the translator's prejudice gets in the way of language there. They're confounded because God has acted in a way they did not anticipate. He has given his imprimatur to his son's teaching of the value of that man. And again, sometimes this idea brought him into conflict. This is my last slide. Uh, brought him into conflict with his contemporaries, or the Hasidim. Their value of the human individual, because they were drawn to um, the marginalized, those who were on the outside. And in order to continue to engage them, the sick, the poor, those who maybe were not living up to the standards that the uh, religious community felt like was necessary, uh, they, they had a choice. Either we continue to commit ourselves to these individuals to stay in good relationship with them, to, to reach out to them, or we withdraw and we abandon them. 
And we find this actually in Jesus as well. Uh, the setting which you're familiar with, you hear this on a couple of occasions, the opening of Luke's uh, text there in Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners, so those are your marginalized folks, were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Please notice something that's seldom picked up in the commentaries. Whenever there's a question about Jesus' association with the sinners, it's always at meals. This is not the question of moral association, but it's, it's actually having to do with purity laws, the requirements of meals in terms of, of what's allowed, not allowed uh, there. So Jesus is finding himself dining in situations that are risky, let's say it like that, because they may not be to the standards that these other critics would want it to be. So Jesus has a choice. If I continue to engage them around the table, there's a certain risk that I won't be able to keep the standards that I might otherwise do or that these people want us to do. It's always criticism because he's eating with them. It's not because he's walking with them. It's dining, and it has to do with issues of purity which is the same problem that the Hasidim had with the sages, with the Pharisees. And so they criticize him because he's dining with them. He's putting himself in a vulnerable environment. And Jesus responds, of course, with the two parables which you know about the lost sheep and the lost coin. But in light of what we've been talking about this evening, now read those parables about the lost one sheep, the lost one coin. The shepherd was willing to leave behind the 99 because of the value of the one. It's not a question of math. It's a question of value. In the eyes of the shepherd, the 99 can be left behind because it can be left to the side because no one gets left behind. No one gets lost. Jesus is, this is his response to the criticism. It's because each one of those individuals has immeasurable value to God. And for me, that's great news. Because I realize that even in my own failings and my own problems, my own stumbling, that God has seized me of having value uh, and wants the best for me. And that's, that's good news. And I think that comes out of the gospel uh, for us and for others. Thank you for listening. Um, I went over a little bit, but you can just say, well, we're not going to let you speak tomorrow night then. Uh, and that will, that will be my punishment. So uh, I, do we have time for a few questions? Um, would you like to ask questions? Would you, I, I'm talking to the tech people, to the tech person. I don't have a question. Uh, no, no, you're, you're, you're uh, are there any questions? Did I say anything tonight that provoked you? Uh, yes. Uh, Provoke in a good way. In a good way. Um, when you were speaking of the parables, when you, were of the parables um, you mentioned that they were not intended to, to hide truths. Say it again? You, when you were speaking about parables, they were never intended to hide truths. That was one of your yes. seven stipulations. I don't where you're going to go. Go ahead. Okay, so help me understand Luke 8, 10. What? Luke 8, 10. It's a, it's, I'm not avoiding it. I don't have time. It's a very, it is, it, I, I'm working on a book on, I feel like I'm putting this all off. I'm writing a book on parables, on gospel parables. What happened is that you saw the book up there. I'll answer you in a roundabout way, but it's, it's, it'll be a non-answer, I'll confess. Um, I realized I, I worked with Zeph Safrai in doing this collection of parables, and then um, I translated, I was immersed completely in, in 456 parables on the inside. And um, it was only later that I could step at, back and look at them and see the general trend of parables. And at first, the publisher said, we want you to write a book on parable, on, or we want to have a Christian version. I said, so what does that mean? We put Jesus' 40 parables in here and call it Christian? I said, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. So we started talking and I went back to the classroom and I started teaching and trying to use books I know and people I know and love and like uh, using their books, but I kept, I kept reading them, interpreting parables that were not 
It didn't fit. They were interpreting the parables in a way that nobody talks, no one who uses parables talks like that. It's, it's, they're, they're not, it, and, and it, not from a question of faith, it's a question of genre. They just, no one talks, 456 parables, I'll give you one example, 456 parables, since I'm not gonna answer that question, I'll give you something to replace it. And 456 parables, we have no parables about eschatology. How many times do we read Jesus' parables eschatological? You know, the coming of the, the bridegroom, the banquet. We have almost an identical parable about a banquet, being invited to the banquet and coming uh, um, not attired, you know, not dressed correctly, not being prepared for it. Um, and, and it's almost identical to the one we encounter in the Gospels. The preamble for it, though, is very important. It starts like this. A, uh, the sage tells his student, uh, repent, on the la uh, repent on your last day. Not the last day, but on your last day. To which he responded, Rabbi, how am I supposed to know what is my last day? And he said, right, you should be repenting every day. And then he quoted the passage in, in Ecclesiastes, let your garments always be white. So we have this idea that runs through the rabbinic parables of being prepared to give an account for your life on your last day. It's talking about the end. It's just not talking about the end of days. And we tend, and so when I started going back and looking at Jesus' parables, I go, okay, I can read these eschatologically, but I don't have to. They're not necessitated. And so it started to make me go back and reread these parables and coming back around now to your original question, what I came away with is that there are, parables are the way you talk about theology. They, they are the theological, they're the vehicles for conveying theological ideas. If you want to know what Jesus' theology was, read the parables. They are the theology of Jesus. And so I went back and started reading them, sort of laying down my own things I'd grown up reading or I'd thought all these years. And I said, okay, let's start fresh. In light of this collection of 456 Jewish parables and say, what are my other possibilities here? And I found that there are about seven or eight bullet points of Jesus's main theological points in his message. Um, but before I could do that, I realized I was going to have to deal with this very difficult text that everyone assumes that Jesus, based on that one, that Jesus tells his parables to tell secrets so that no one knows. Um, what I can tell you is that there is absolutely nothing in the history of Judaism in, in parables uh, that reflects that idea at all. I think there's something, and the chapter is actually written. It's just it's complicated because of what Jesus is doing there. It's actually not it's not simple, but it is quite clear what he's communicating there. And certainly it's not to, to, to use parables to tell secrets. Um, I don't think he's quoting from Isaiah, I should say there. I think he's quoting from Ezekiel on that text that it's not, you know, that I, I teach in, in order that they might not understand. I think there's, there are other things that are going on there. That can't be Isaiah because he reverses the hearing and the... Um, the hearing and the saying. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, see, seeing and hearing. He reverses the ones from Isaiah, uh, which is the first thing that clued me in that there's a problem here. Uh, he's not quoting that. He would know better than to turn that upside down. Uh, instead, he's quoting from Ezekiel chapter 12 uh, with a completely different <laughs> message of what's going on. But the long and the short of it is that we, we don't, we're talking about a very specific culture, and there, there is nothing, not a hint. I remember one day I was, I was actually asked to train guides at Neot Kedumim, which is the, the reserve for biblical landscape, and they, they said, help us, what can we do for Christians coming here? And I said, well, if there's nothing else you can do, help Christians understand that Jesus didn't tell parables to keep secrets. And they all started laughing. They thought I was joking. And, they, and then they saw I was serious. And they said, you're kidding. I said, no, it's, this is you, almost unanimous. 
Every Christian thinks that Jesus told parables so people outside could not understand what he was saying. And they, just, they couldn't get past it. It doesn't exist in that culture. Parables are told to take grand ideas and simplify them in, in very simple terms that especially the uneducated can grasp. This is why they're popular. It's why Jesus is always telling them on the streets, at dinners, that they're, they're a way of conveying to people who don't have the training and the ability to sort of engage the biblical text. But I, it, it's a, it would need, I could do it, but it would take another lecture to talk about. I'm sorry, I'm not, that sounds like I'm cheating and I don't mean to. Is it just potentially that like, he's pointing out that if they don't see, if they don't hear, like, the simple, that for me to be simple and, and on that particular passage, I would go with Matthew's. They don't all read the same. Uh, in, Matthew, in Luke and Mark, it reads, I teach in parables in order that they may not understand. Matthew says, I teach in parables because they do not understand, which actually I think is the thrust. And that fits, that fits the use of parables. That actually... And again, I don't want to get into the whole synoptic relationship because uh, that could get me in big trouble. But they, uh, but that they don't all read identically there. And I, in that particular passage, I would lean a little bit more heavily upon uh, Matthew's preservation of that statement. All right, others. Hopefully, an easier one. <laughs> Parables. Okay. That from what I understand, that parable to be, um, and any this is just from my take on it, is that it tests or it reveals the condition or the temperature of the heart. When you tell a story, either it is going to reveal to you what it's intended to reveal, and for some whose heart is not tender for what he wants to convey, it, it, it's not as clear. As an artist, when I paint a picture especially if it's relate to scripture, people that have, are, are close to, to what the word of God says, it, they immediately see the artist's interpretation, but the ones that aren't, they look at it and don't understand, but the ones that do know, they, they formulate questions that elude to that. Um, just like what, with Nathan and to David, I think when he had to expose him of his sin or help him understand what he was doing was sinful, he had to give him a story. And David's heart was tender at that point to where I understand that, but it was a conviction that happened in his heart that at that point, I, th I would say that his heart was already tender to you know, saying that I have to repent of this. Would you say that that in, in, you know, sometimes we have to tell story in parables so that they can relate to, to what's going on in their life and hopefully yeah, I, cause. The, the story of Nathan and David, I would class, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I'm, I, I'm not opposed to the, the idea there. The story of Nathan and David is one that I, I use for parallels, particularly towards the passion narrative, speaking to power, sometimes speaking and using parables to speak to power, which what Jesus does with the parable of the wicked husbandman, he's actually calling people out, challenging them through the use of a parable. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a, it, this whole, and of course you would ask the one question that, uh, it is, it is the most difficult text not difficult test, it's the most difficult idea because it's such a entrenched notion, this idea that Jesus is teaching in parables in order that people will, will not understand him, which is a really, on one hand, it's sort of a bizarre notion. You think about Jesus, I'm going to talk in a way that nobody can understand what I'm saying. Uh, but again, for me on that particular passage, I would lean a little bit more heavily on the, the tradition that we have from Matthew's gospel there. Uh, the shorter, he actually repeats himself, and I would take the shorter portion there where he says, I teach in parables because hearing they do not hear and seeing they do not see. Uh, and it's because they're, they're without understanding 
that he's using parables. They, they, don't, they don't have already the ability to see or to hear, and he's, he's using that. So um, others? Could you say a bit about what you think the source of Jesus' education was? Would have it been just through the, uh, the local synagogue, or would he been possibly have sent away to a rabbinic school somewhere? Or how much of it was the mix of his divine nature and human nature? Um, first of all, I, I believe there is... He was fully God and fully man, so I always have to start there. Uh, it's interesting when you always talk about Jesus and his Jewishness, people always assume, oh, so you're, you're sort of uh, reducing his, his deity. I said, no, it's, he was, the history of the church, he's fully God and fully man. Um, when it comes to this particular uh, subject, though, I, one, I don't know. I don't know whether he's sent away to school. I know that, that there are, we have traditions about we have rabbinic traditions about schools in the Galilee. Um, there is, among New Testament scholarship, there has been sort of an assumption that Galilee was a backwater and people were not educated. And it was, and I think archaeology has actually helped us to see this was not, you know, this was not a backwater here. There were people, uh, the, the, and they weren't all, you know, living in hovels. They were, they had, sometimes they had frescoed homes. I know Moti's excavations at Yod Fat and other places, uh, and even in ours, we're finding that there are uh, there it, there's a standard of living. One is a bit surprising, and it's not surprising for us, but it's, it's sort of surprising in terms of assumptions that have gone in regarding uh, the setting of Galilee. I my my general assumption is that Jesus was taught. Uh, at least in the beginnings, by at home, uh, by Joseph. That would be my assumption. Uh, we tend to assume that Joseph was illiterate and a blue-collar worker, and you know, because we know his manual profession. Folks, we know the manual profession of every ancient sage. We know them. We know what they did. What did Paul do? Tent maker. Tent maker. Just because we know he's a tent maker doesn't mean that that's all he does. And just because we know the profession of Joseph does not mean that he was illiterate or unlearned. Um, there are a couple of things that hint at it. One, he's called, there are only a few people in the Gospels that are called dikaios, uh, righteous. Uh, but that in Hebrew, the term equivalent is tzaddik. You would never call an ignorant, unlearned man a tzaddik. Uh, I, think, I think Joseph was a learned individual. Um, I'll, I'll try another passage on you. It, this will probably get me stoned, but it's, you know, it's, we're at the end of the evening. So, uh, I read the account of when Jesus got lost. This is actually coming back to your thing. I read the account when Jesus got left in Luke chapter two and he, um, he gets, uh, you know, they're coming up, and he gets left, and, and I don't know why they left him. I don't know whose fault it was. It's, it's usually always the man's fault, but, the, um, <laughs> but he gets left behind, and, they, uh, and they're looking, and they come back after a couple of days, and they come up. They find him in the temple, exchanging with the, uh, the sages, the teachers in the temple. They're all amazed with his wisdom, et cetera, et cetera, and then, then we hear the Jewish mom enter the, enter the picture. So she says, son, why have you done this to us? Uh, we've been looking everywhere for you. And his response, all right, but she, no, she says, she says son, uh, why have you done this to us? You know, you made us anxious. Your father and I have been looking everywhere for you. Now, if you read Joseph Fitzmaier's commentary on these lines, he, he, in his commentary, he's amazed that Luke has allowed these words to fall from Mary's lips, because she's just referred, and I, by the way, I should parenthetically say, I believe in the virgin birth, so I'm not, you know, don't, don't assume things that I'm not saying, but she, that she, he has just referred to Joseph as Jesus' father. Now, my mother was born on the mission field, Southern Baptist, MK, all her life in the church, 
I remember one time I was talking to her about this passage, and she really struggled with what I'm about to say about it. But I asked her the question. Uh, because Jesus responds to Mary, and he says, Why were you looking? Didn't you know where to find me? Isn't it right that I be among, and I'm giving a literal translation of the Greek here, that I'm among the things of my father, that I'm doing what my father would be doing if he was here? And, of course, Fitzmaier turns on a dime and says, Oh, this is Jesus' first consciousness, expression of his divine consciousness by referring to God. And I'm sitting there going, this is a conversation between two people. Where Mary says, your father and I have been looking everywhere. Jesus responds, why were you looking? Didn't you know where to find me? Isn't it right that I'm doing the things that my father would be doing if he was here? I'm among the things of my father. There's no house, by the way. He's not in the father's house. He's doing the things of my father. And again, I talked to my mom about this. And I said, and she says, ah, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. I said, Mom, it all comes down to this. It's very simple. What did Jesus, growing up, what did Jesus refer to Joseph? How did he call him? Did he call him Joe? <laughs> <laughs> he, he would have called him Abba. There's no, this is not a theological, we, we put theology sometimes in things that are very much just as human interaction. Uh, and the reason I do that, and again, Luke takes us to a deeper level there. And he says, ah, people didn't understand what was really being said, which is fine. Fair enough. I'm all right with the sort of the plumbing, the depths of <coughs> spiritual truth. But we have a straightforward conversation going on between them to which I assume that means that Joseph probably spent time among the sages as well. Um, I've told you already this evening, Jesus grew up in a family that put strong emphasis upon following God's word. Uh, what would we expect? God the Father put his son in a home that people don't care, people don't invest themselves in the study of his word. I think he put him in a home where he knew that that would be the environment that he was raised. And I personally think that's, I mean, I don't, that's beyond that, I have no evidence. But, and we, we hear so little about Joseph. We hear almost nothing about him. So we've got these little tidbits. And, and I granted, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write a dissertation on this. You know, but it's, I think that there are hints in there that Joseph was not an unlearned person either. And I would assume in Jewish culture, the responsibility of the parents to train the children, to teach them. I would assume that would have been the first instance, whether he studied outside of the home I can't know, but what I can tell you is that he, he had an unbelievable skill in handling the scripture. I've studied with Jewish scholars for years where they, we, we would set, work with them, they, they're quite amazed at the ability demonstrated in his handling of scripture. He uses contemporary means, things that people are using in that period of time of how they take the scripture and unpack it and read it and apply it in, in for their time. So I, I, he could have been trained outside of, outside of the home. I just don't know. Uh, but I, I would assume that he, 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 he was taught also within, within the home. And filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. Yes. So in that in itself, that, yes, he was probably taught about their faith, but also given the fact that he is the Messiah. Sure. And he, God, loves him. Sure, and I wouldn't deny that. Again, I started in, I'd say he's fully God, fully man. Uh, I'm trying to speak to sort of the human part of that. Uh, I, I, I don't think his humanity gets eclipsed uh, by his deity. Um, and I, I think that's one of the parts of our faith is that he's experienced all the things that we've experienced in terms of the challenges of this life. So, okay. Bob, or... I got two questions. He always has the hard questions. <laughs> My first one is an extension of Dr. Hollinger's. Uh, 
educating the disciples. If you remember, Luke says they stood before the elders and they were called unschooled and ignorant men. How did, how did Jesus deal with these 12 over the three years in terms of the uh, disciple-making process? Having taught students, you have ones of varying abilities. Some are better than, <laughs> <laughs> some are better than others. Uh, so I'm not going to suggest that they all became, you know, uh, sages. I think sometimes they, um, I, I think sometimes we, we the, the, the rhetoric that we have, we, we sometimes sort of take it, uh, you hear the rabbis talk about, they also talk about Galilee in very disparaging terms, and, you know, it's sort of this, you know, it's sort of like New York and New Jersey, you know, that they, they sort of this bantering back or South Carolina and North Carolina, uh, back and forth there. Um, so, I mean, I, I hear, and it is recorded there, that it's sort of a disparaging fashion now. They're really, they're really country bumpkins. They're ignorant. Um, but I, I don't know that we should necessarily assume that they're totally unlearned, untrained. Um, and probably some are better than others. I, uh, we, we don't know much about their, you know, their youth, their growing up. Jesus gets them in, in adulthood, uh, which is a bit of a challenge. Sometimes it's not, I mean, Rabbi, was it Rabbi Kiva, who doesn't even start till he's 40, and doesn't begin to learn. Uh, so some of us are late bloomers. Uh, and the, uh, you know, I think that's, that has to be taken into account. So I, I don't know exactly in terms of what, I think Jesus spent time with them. Uh, I don't think they, uh, you know, he may not, it may not have been a yeshiva. It may not have been a, you know, formal school. Uh, but I, and, and I don't know about their abilities. We really don't hear a lot. We hear a couple of the disciples, of course, Peter, Paul, well, Paul's not with them. And we get John. Uh, so we hear some of them seem to be have a little bit more ability than others. Uh, but I, I don't know how he dealt with them. Uh, I mean, I was joking, but only half joking. And I'm sure in your, in your career, you've had students who showed up. And, you, know, you, you know, what you're working with in terms of trying to bring them along, uh, sometimes people are, are, you know, have a lot of things to make up. So I, I don't know in terms of, of his, uh, we don't seem to get much from, much insight into um, formal teaching. We get, you know, we get these sayings and things, but in terms of how to read text or the types of things I was talking about this evening, in terms of the, the midot, the exegetical principles, we don't, have, we don't have any of that reflected in Jesus sort of uh, communicating those skills to his disciples. So, um, but I, I just would caution the, the idea, you know, based on the fact that they, that, act, that verse in Acts is a classic verse that New Testament scholars have used to suggest that Galilee was ignorant. And that, that is, so they've taken that and sort of taken it and, and expanded it to talk about the entire Galilee. And we're, we're in a process now of trying to correct that with, with you know, uh, and, and I, this is some of the normal disparaging that goes on, regional disparaging goes on. Uh, so I, uh, I don't know if I would say that they're all unlearned. Uh, I, I don't know. That would be my second question. Uh, Hopefully they get easier. <laughs> uh, what was the role of the question in the teaching and learning practice of Jesus' day? Say it again. What was the role of a question in the pedagogy of Jesus and teaching his disciples because there are 125 yes. well, I count them, but thank you for that teaching and, and learning situations 113 of them start with a question yes. always it's uh, you know I, I would say Socratic sort of that Socratic method um, and you know the, the example I used tonight from Luke 10, 
uh, the person who comes to him and says, you know, what must I do to attain eternal life? He turns it on its head and says, well, you know the scripture. How do you read it? And so the, the, that I think it's the, it's, the, it's the powerful process of, of the student learning to ask the right question and helping them to learn what are appropriate questions. Not appropriate questions. What are the right questions to ask? Um, I had a teacher who told me once, years ago, university professor, told me that it wasn't until he turned 50 he realized it was more important to ask the right questions than it was to have the right answers. Because you can have the answer, but it can be to the wrong question. And I think you, you see that in Jewish, in sort of Jewish pedagogy, where they, they like to tease out the, and sometimes there's more than one answer to the question. So it's learning to, to frame and to ask the right question that will, um, elicit the discussion and and the we focus on the answers and when if you read rabbinic literature you know they'll have a question there and then they'll say rabbi a says this rabbi i should say use the hebrew alphabet rabbi bait says this rabbi gimel says this and they they'll have these they'll have three answers and so you're waiting for the conclusion and who got it right and it moves on the answer isn't as important as the question and the discussion surrounding it. So I think, I think that they, they understand in the culture, I think Jesus is very much a part of that culture, where the importance of questioning, raising the questions and, and, and engaging it, it's, it's the engagement that's, that's the wonderful thing. Um, and it's, um, I'm sometimes asked why I went to study with David Flusser. And I went over for a month in uh, 1983. It's a younger then. And I got the chance to sit in his class. And he was teaching. I can't remember the passage of scripture he was teaching on. And it was always in his dining room. We sat in his house around the dining table, packed out there. And he was teaching on some particular passage and um, explaining it. And he got to a certain point, and one of the students stopped him and said, Professor Flusser, I don't understand this. Um, I was in this class. This was an unending class. Every year it was the same, every Tuesday evening for years. And so students would take it for years on end. You would, as long as I was there, I always went on Tuesday evenings to study his house, whether you're registered or not registered. This student stops him and says, uh, I was in this class three years ago, and you explained the passage this way. Now you're explaining it that way. Um, and Flusser just looked at him and said, I don't understand. He says, I, I, I would hope that every day I'm coming closer and closer to the truth. And that for me, if, if you've ever, those of you who have some have been in academic circles where a person reads their notes that they wrote 40 years ago and haven't budged. And to, to be with a person who's willing to jettison everything because they, they have uh, what he, he used to call a cumulative logic where there may be another stone drops and the ripples work their way through. You have to rethink everything. And so it's sometimes it's more important being just the engagement and getting new insights, looking at this way, that way. And that's what the question brings up as we engage those questions. Um, this is why I started off this evening and said, it's never my desire that you agree with me because I may come back in five years and you may say the same thing to me. And that, that's never the purpose. The purpose is, is to engender a conversation and engagement on these issues. Uh, whether we agree, disagree, it really doesn't matter. It's the engagement there that, that rises from the question. And it's really a question, a conversation that should never end. We should always be open to inf new information, new insights that can cause us to sort of rethink things and have us have a better understanding. So I think that's the culture is why you have so many questions like that because it's, they realize that it's the engagement that's important. Finally, uh, is the- You only had two questions. <laughs> <laughs> but as you were talking, another one was born. Okay, okay. That's what I get for talking so much. Okay. Uh, is the making of a disciple 
a Jewish practice or a Hellenistic practice? Hebrew, of course, the word disciple is Talmud. It's a student. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think either, either community has a, uh, has a um, monopoly on it. Of course, the Jewish practice, I mean, the, um, you have the schools of the prophets in the old times, going back into your half of the book, uh, to, to talk about it. I mean, uh, you would have more Greek, you have the Greek schools growing up, uh, that would predate anything that we have in Judaism. So on one hand, you could say, well, this is a, a Greek influence upon Jewish culture. I wouldn't be opposed to that. Uh, and again, you have to always remember that the land of, not you, I mean, uh, <laughs> remember that the land of Israel is the land between. Uh, it's, it's, you have east and west. And, and so we find... Um, you know, we find the combinations of those. So I, I would have no problem in seeing uh, you know, Greek influences that find their way into Jewish culture where people rise up behind it, a certain individual and um, give their life to study with them, to accompany them, to study with them. Uh, that could very well be, uh, certainly in terms of time frame, we would find it more in the Greek schools. Uh, in the, in the classical Greek period, and that may have translated into and influenced uh, uh, Jewish culture in the intertestamental period and on into the New Testament. Good question. Okay. Let's give uh, Dr. Notley a round of applause. To thank him for coming and sharing his time with us. And uh, let me remind you, as I did last night, the Cooley website has a lot of our lectures and resources there. And in the coming weeks, we will have a, a new page added that will include all of our announcements and news. So uh, information regarding our upcoming Israel trip, our trip to the Museum of the Bible, that will be found there. So keep, keep checking back to the, to the Cooley website. Let's close with prayer. My Father, we are grateful for this time that we've had over the last two evenings to uh, grow in our knowledge, and I think that Dr. Notley concluded well tonight that we should always engage our minds and be open to your Spirit's leading and to the direction of your Word. May we be students of the Word that are faithful to interpret it according to the principles uh, that we learn, but also the way your Spirit guides and leads us. Thank you for Gordon Conwell and its ministry in our lives. Thank you for the Cooley Center. Pray for Dr. Notley as he returns and pray for safety for travel for him and for blessings upon his teaching ministry and his work in Israel. May your hand be upon him. Uh, bless us as we go home this night. Keep us safe in our, in our travels in this weather. And we again praise you for all that you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.